All right, it looks like we are live, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, this is a special live stream looking at the State Rivalries series that the Cynical Historian, Cypher from the Cynical Historian, and myself have started. And our second batch of episodes came out last Thursday, and they're a lot of fun. Uh, we are, I think this is uh, probably even more fun, though, because we're going to reveal some of our favorite comments and, and feedback about the videos and the trash talking on these videos were just amazing. This, like, especially <laughs> I'm impressed with Michigan and Ohio uh, residents just being creative with their trash talking. Yeah. On, <laughs> the funny thing on mine uh, on uh, Kentucky, Ver, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia and Virginia is like, everybody is saying like, it's a friendly rivalry. But they're all a bunch of incestuous blah blah blah. And it's like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, you got a Friend little nasty already. I mean, that that might be a little too friendly, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and then uh, I also find it fascinating how it always, like, I, I in my video I mentioned mostly the sports rivalry is kind of what has uh, kept on going today. It started with a war. Um, but then also, of course, the comments creeped in about the drivers, like so many comments about drivers. And this is the same thing that happened when we did the first yeah, two episodes. <laughs> I mean, every state, I'm sure, has complaints about neighboring states and their drivers. Um, like Nevada is in a pretty unique place because, I mean, while you have to deal with California drivers and that... Um, and California is just renowned for that kind of crap. You also have to deal with drivers from everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it's just one of those things. It's a universal complaint that we all have, I guess. But yeah, I, before we kind of dig into the comments, I wanted to uh, kind of give like a, let the viewers, especially the viewers who are newer to our channels, the subscribers who are newer, um, some more background on, uh, I guess, you and I, because we go pretty far back. I mean, we go back further than most of the YouTubers I know. I think I met you uh, through YouTube at least. It was probably 2014. Does that sound right? Something it like that. It would have been like early 2014, late 2013. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's pretty crazy. It's probably 2013, I think, is when I first just like actually watched one of your videos. And I was thinking like back then we were both very small, uh, of course, and we're still relatively small channels compared to the big dogs obviously but um i noticed like back even when i first discovered your channel like i had quite a few more subscribers at the time and then i remember there was like a certain point where you it probably was your uh the slavery video yeah the slavery the top the top 10 or the 10 slave myths video that blew up and so then you just went shot up past me and then like I caught up with you again, but then you shot up past me again, and then it's funny. <laughs> and so, why why I bring this up is because we we kind of recently realized that uh, when we released these two videos, we pretty much both had the exact same number of subscribers uh, when we released last Thursday. So that was a little trippy. That was not planned. We did not plan that. <laughs> um, Heck, so I'm been hoping planning this video for, since the last one. Exactly. Yeah, and the last one came out last September. So. Uh, the like uh, in case you missed that one, check it out. Uh, the two episodes, the first two were uh, I did Kansas versus Missouri since I'm from Kansas and we hate Missouri, Missouri of course. And then uh, you did New Mexico versus uh, Texas, which apparently it's all New Mexico just hating Texans and Texans are kind of like for the most part. Eh. Yeah, well, it's, you know, Texans also like are surprised, like, how could you possibly hate us? Yeah, you know? <laughs> how could anybody hate us? Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's like, um, maybe because you invaded us three times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that could be a reason. Just maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, it does seem the hatred is a little bit more with uh, Ohio and Michigan. I, it was, I mean, like, I couldn't tell sometimes if they were joking some of these comments or if they were just. They really did have the hatred of the other. Can, and then I noticed also Toledo, if they were from Toledo, they generally were kind of apathetic or neutral and just kind of just made fun of Toledo. 
like people people in Toledo do not have tri do not have pride of their city. I should say it's not. Uh, what did you notice about your comments about with West Virginia and Virginia? Well, West Virginians, for the most part, say that there is a rivalry still going on in both directions. Um, but it's it's you know friendly. It's not like actual hate. Uh, I mean, here in like New Mexico, for instance, um, especially here in Albuquerque, you have like actual like, you know, people who are kind of afraid to say that they're from Texas kind of thing. Yeah. Like it's it's that bad. But um, in in it doesn't appear to be the case in West Virginia that it's um, that it's taken like that. And whereas yours is kind of like, you know, both sides think of each other equally virginia is doing the same thing texas does where it's like oh i guess there's a west virginia okay <laughs> yeah i i asked the question on my uh in my comments who do you think got the better deal with the the toledo war michigan or ohio and overwhelmingly they said michigan uh with the <laughs> upper peninsula and it's like plus ohio just got toledo and you know um so I thought that was interesting. Like, uh, but then we had a, there was one comment that talked specifically about, like it actually, he had a lot of data to back up how Ohio actually got the advantage. Like he was bringing up uh, economic data and like mm -hmm. census numbers and uh, just kind of dug into the demographics about, <laughs> oh, and then other people said the real loser in the Toledo war was Wisconsin because Wisconsin was supposed to get the upper peninsula. So. <laughs> Poor Wisconsin. Yeah, well, if I remember correctly, it's also Connecticut lost big time too, because Connecticut had the Upper Peninsula. Um, oh yeah, there was. What, now, how did that work again? I remember hearing something I about that. I think that was actually what was transferred during uh, during the Toledo War was that it was officially transferred from no. I uh, I do not remember. I'd've... Obviously. <laughs> You've That's got your me side of the very project. intrigued. <laughs> I did not remember hearing Connecticut from my research, but maybe I'm I, thinking a comment or something. Well, one of the weird things about Connecticut is that they kept on making claims further and further west. You know, that at one point they had like everything that was, um, you know, like even where um, uh, it's a Canadian city now, I forget what it's called. Um, Tristan from step backs from there, uh, Toronto. Um, yeah. And like they, they claimed all of that at one point. And then like, they got uh, like a chunk that was missing from, uh, from Pennsylvania. So they moved down there and then eventually they got the upper peninsula for a limited time. Obviously there was mm -hmm. no like actual control, but they had the claim. Yeah, ah, uh, it's funny how many claims were made in those early days. It's just like sovereignty was kind of a, a loose term, I think, for a lot. Of, like, yeah, we got that area there. Well, we can't even map it. Well, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's really interesting when you see these like maps of like you know the U.S. expansion, and then they're like, here's the Louisiana Purchase, and it's like this concrete area where it's like, oh well, it's the entire you know Mississippi watershed. And it's like, yeah. uh, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> was was it really? Because I remember this whole fur wars thing happening in uh, ha happening with the British, and it's like, you know, somehow we still had claim to Washington, even though according to those maps, it had nothing to do with the Louisiana Purchase. Mm -hmm. And then there's also all those arguments about Texas being included in the Louisiana Purchase. It's like, it, like even to the people who were making those decisions, there was no concrete thing. It was just how much can we claim? Yeah. Oh yeah. And like you said in uh, like your guest spot in my video, how even if they they didn't realize that there were, you know, natural resources that they could economically benefit from, I think just the idea of like more land in general, like yeah, um, they. It, you know, you look at a map of the United States, you look at the original 13 colonies, and for the most part, they're pretty small. But as you work your way west further and further, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And 
Yeah. Um, Although there's lot. something funny that, like, obviously I couldn't clarify it in the video, but when I said, uh, you know, just ask California and Texas, um, both of those states uh, had a very different territorial claim when they entered the union. Um, mm -hmm. Like, uh, all of what is Arizona under the Mexican regime was actually under Alta California. And obviously, mm -hmm. we fought we fought the Mexican American War over uh, over Texan claims of t taking all the way from the Rio Grande to the Nueces Strip. Like where I am right now in Albuquerque, was claimed by Texas. In fact, they sent an expedition yeah. there, one of their invasions. Um, well, they sent it to Santa Fe. But if you're on this side of the river, you by their claims you were in texas so mm. both of those states actually had a massive reduction of what they wanted california by choice texas not so much um you know the federal government actually had to step in on that hence yeah. the comp compromise of 1850. um so one of those interesting things of like california actually denied a, ma a bunch of territory <laughs> why did they do that uh, they just didn't want to try to govern it. They basically said, uh, well, there's like this thing being set up in Utah. Like you guys have this whole Deseret claim, like let, let, let them do that. Um, yeah. you know, it's the same thing with Idaho where they were like, there's all these mountains to the, um, to the East of us. And eh, we don't, we don't like miners. So, uh, just give it to Montana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Interesting. That's crazy. You don't hear that too too often. <laughs> yeah. but it makes sense though. Like, yeah, you want to be able to enforce laws from far and doing it from far away. It's yeah in the, the early days without modern transportation. <laughs> but it's also one of those things of like that's the difference between the states who are just talking about like whether or not they want to govern it versus the nation literally going like that California looks really nice. Hey, Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, the, uh, the other reason why Toledo was so important, of course, was the, uh, the waterway, which you, uh, of course, explained very well in your guest appearance in my video. And it is kind of funny how, you know, I don't know, less than 20 years later, railroads are built. Um, around the area it's just like oh well i guess that canal was really wasn't that big a deal after all uh, well funny thing is there was actually an operational um railroad coming from toledo before the canal was finished no kidding yeah Jeez. it's like 1838 yeah um, it was a small gauge railroad so obviously couldn't uh it, it a narrow gauge i mean um couldn't uh -huh. really handle that much freight but it was enough to uh, already start challenging the canal yeah but we're talking like it started being built in like 1835 so like that wasn't as much of a concern to the people fighting the toledo war yeah also railroads were this strange new thing that like what why are you, why are you guys putting iron on on the ground <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's kind of like uh think about self-driving cars today and how people are like that's not going to take over how could that take over and <laughs> 10 years later it's going to take over <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's i could see it, it same thing that happened with canals and that where it's like eventually it come becomes like why are you driving your own car <laughs> um i do want to say i got a super chat already so thanks ty jones shout out to ty jones and of course he says go green so if you want to get those go blue and go green super chats in, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> you probably have no idea what that reference is, do you? No. The sports rivalry between Michigan and Ohio State. So, well, I'm. I guess I'm wearing green right now. So, go green. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. That's, that says Cal Poly, though. So. <laughs> um. So did you were there any other comments that you wanted to bring up from the actual videos that we released? Oh yeah, well, um the 
the one thing, the one bit of criticism I've gotten. Well, first, there's a lot of people complaining that I that I don't care about sports, and Orion <laughs> Force, I don't care about sports. So. Yes, <laughs> I do, but I'm weird, so I'm a dork. <laughs> it's it's an interesting thing in uh, my like my cohort right now, where it's like half of them care and like half of them don't, you know. So when we go to bars and everything, it's like you'll have the one group who's talking about sports stuff, and then it's like instantly like, yeah, you guys, you guys do your thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about important things. Um, but the uh, the other criticism is that a lot of people, or, well, I shouldn't say a lot. I got two comments that were complaining that I used that I said that John Brown was trying to start a race war. Um. And admittedly, that might be a bit of hyperbole. Yeah. But at the same time, if you read him, um, he was not differentiating between the oppression of slavery and the oppression of race. So when he wanted to start a rebellion of slavery, he wanted to start a rebellion of race. Mm -hmm. um, so these are inherently linked concepts. Oh, yeah. He wanted to start a race war. Um, I think people get, they just automatically like, get a little triggered when they hear the word race in anything. Like it's yeah. a word that kind of riles people up. Well, I think it's also like one of them was <laughs> like, it said something like, um, you know, uh, he was trying to liberate slaves. Um, he was a hero. How, how dare you uh, slander him? They actually use the word slander. <laughs> and it's like the guy was the guy was a violent megalomaniac. Like <laughs> he he committed a massacre in Kansas. Like why do we not see this? Why do we see this as redeemable? But like slavery not. Right. You know, at that point, he's just as bad as the slavers. Like, if you're gonna if you're gonna make heroes and martyrs out of people, you have to apply it equally. If mm. your ethics don't match up with your own ethics, you're a hypocrite. Um. Yeah, it's uh, and, it's amazing how controversial of a figure he still is all these years later. Like. Yeah, well, I mean, like, it, it's one of those things of, like, fighting for the right cause, yeah, fighting for the right cause in the wrong way. Yeah, you know? oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a reason why, like, the Secret Six were all white. Uh, it, the Secret Six were the, were the main supporters of the raid at Harper's Ferry. Um, he did try to get uh, uh, Fred, Frederick... Uh, uh Douglas, Frederick Douglas, um yeah. to to support it. And Douglas was like, You're trying to start a race war, dude, and this isn't gonna work. Just piss off. Um <laughs> like Frederick Douglas had a pretty good head on his shoulders. <laughs> pretty good head of hair too. Uh but like Yeah he did. That that hair dude man, that's legendary. Um but like the uh he understood that this was bound to fail and only create more hatred. And that's precisely what it did. And like, there's a, once again, reason why the secret six were all white. Although something that isn't talked about is Harriet Tubman was totally a financial backer. And she, uh, she in fact helped ferry some of the weaponry to the jumping off points. So I wouldn't say that all supporters were white, um, you know, Harriet Tubman has blood on her hands, but you know, she also like literally fought in the Civil War. So, <laughs> yeah, I had no idea she she helped fund the uh, yeah she, she helped fund Harper's Ferry. Yeah, that's crazy. I never knew that. Wow. Yeah. She did, was there anything she didn't do? <laughs> Man, <laughs> put up with people who were insulting her on the train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's. I still say there should be a movie about her. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, Especially her time in the uh, Civil War. Like, 
all her like secret freaking um you know raids and everything like she literally led yeah. a raid that that's awesome yeah she was a general says right. essentially yeah you know, um the, the bloody time in 1859 to 1860 is not exact. Well, I mean, basically the whole 1850s is just not a good time for any side of that uh, debate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I, one comment that I noticed uh, on my video that uh, was uh, kind of is good to know is that in uh, Ohio, um, no wait, is it no? I'm sorry, it's in Michigan. I had a commenter that was who had lived in both Ohio and Michigan, um, but yeah, in Michigan they apparently they do have a semester long class where they look at Michigan history and uh, they spend a lot of time on the on the Toledo War. And so yeah, it, pretty much everybody does remember it because um, I in my video I said at the end like you know people think of the rivalry more today about sports than the Toledo War, but Apparently, I was wrong. Like there are many, like uh, Michiganders and Ohio Ohioans that know all about it still to this day. Well, I think it's fueled by the uh, by the uh, sports rivalry. Yeah, that's how. That's because I I found an article uh, about the football teams playing, and within a couple of years, this like a newspaper published this article. Like, yeah, and they started. They framed the article with the. The, the big game, the game, as they call it. And then they went, oh, and also the Toledo War, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so Yeah, that's and that's normally how it's framed is that, like, we hate Michigan first. And then it's like retroactively, oh, yeah, there was this one thing back in 1835. Like, that's the reason why. It's like <laughs> if that was the reason why, then why wasn't there some sort of lasting effects connecting these? Like, yeah. That that's part of why, like we talked, uh, your cut in on mine, which was the uh, um, the Supreme Court cases. Like this was an ongoing issue. This like um, Virginia wa was still angry about West Virginia, and West Virginia was angry about Virginia trying to, you know, impugn their sovereignty, mm -hmm. um, and. Funny thing is, they both won and lost on that whole interaction. Um, yeah, but the uh, the um, you know that's that's not just something that like suddenly in 1911 it matters again. It's that this was an ongoing thing. There was literally a party, a political party in Virginia, devoted to trying. I, I think they were called the uh, the um, levelers or something like that i might be mixing them up with like british levelers but um yeah the there was a literal party devoted to trying to get that money from west virginia um and eventually it made it to the supreme court you don't that's that's not something that like suddenly flares up again because of a sports rivalry that's quite literally constant bickering back and forth right you know, and while I think it's pretty much died down, um, you know, that's that's very real. That's not that's not just mythological. Whereas I hate to say it, but like this whole this whole connection between the Michigan Ohio rivalry now and the Toledo War, it's myth. It's it, like you even mm -hmm. said it in your thing. It's like, well, there there were some people in the stands probably from from uh this it's like they weren't they weren't talking about it during the game they weren't like saying like <laughs> this is another battle for toledo or anything <laughs> yeah because that was 1897 the first time that ohio state michigan played and you could also say well, what about other ohio teams playing michigan like it so yeah i think they're disconnected it was later on that they're like oh let's just tie in the toledo war with this game this rivalry that already exists <laughs> you Although, know but while we're on the subject of of like mythological connections to these kinds of former things it's this is actually kind of related to how nationalism forms right mm. um this this is basically these two states being nationalistic while they didn't actually have a a rivalry between them um up until that 
until the sports rivalry. Um, in order to legitimate the sports rivalry to as like this thing that the states can can say is their own, mm-hmm. they have to connect it to this greater past. And that's that's how nations are formed. I bet you there's some people from Ohio and Michigan right now, maybe like, like, what is he saying about us? You know, but like, yeah, there's, <laughs> it's funny that you say that because um, I'm making a video right now. My next video is about the difference between nationalism and patriotism, you know, and it, what inspired me to make it originally was, you know, President Trump uh, calling himself a nationalist a few months ago. And then the reaction to that, the negative reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, you you made that Nations Aren't New video a long time ago that I really loved that. It's just a, a fascinating thing how not only has that term uh, changed in a short amount of time, because na- nationalism and patriotism used to be synonyms like in the um, like early 1800s, you could say. But then, yeah, just quickly how that well, changed. Nationalism as in an ism doesn't mm-hmm. actually come about like the actual etymology of it being said as nationalism mm-hmm. isn't until like the 1860s or something like that. It, oh, it, okay. It's actually it, like the rise of nations and everything. Like they're still saying nation as a, as a noun, not an ism. Um, yeah. That's, that's basically historians going back and, and well, the, the literal foundation of our profession is nationalism. Um, Herder, um, the uh, Herda de Ronca is is it's a famous what the heck is that book uh something anderson like benedict anderson is a really famous book um sounds familiar imagine communities that's it okay um so the subtitle of it is something like the origin of nations um and it's talking about how this idea of nationalism came to be and in basically infected the history profession at its birth. So you get like Herder who is isolating the idea of culture as if it's like this, instead of culture being this thing that like you cultivate something, all of a sudden Kultur at, under, uh, you know, German is Kultur, um, is about like exclusion that like they are not our culture it's about authenticity all of a sudden okay um and that's kind of where uh, this this whole german culture is where we get our modern notions of nation um as in like a not just a political entity but a uh but a people because the idea of disparate peoples being united by a language that wasn't really a thing until 1848. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, like, so, like, our whole, I, the whole system of history that we use, very much founded by Ronka, is so crazy. Is, uh, okay, we got uh, some anti Semitism oh. going on. Oh, um, there's apparently there's some anti-Semitic comments. What? What? Yeah, I got it. Oh, okay. And also the super chat. I got it. Um, so let's check the super chat here. Sorry, guys. We. Uh, okay, Kyle the Kyle the Jelly Man Pro. How you doing? Yeah, I recognize that name. Uh, he says, "Mr. Beat, can you do another top ten best U.S. presidents?" We're running out of presidents, though, Kyle. That's the problem. <laughs> so, um, I think uh, I, I do plan on doing another top ten best U.S. presidents video uh, in a few years, maybe, perhaps, like maybe, you know, maybe ten years or something. Uh, but I, I do. I'm doing. Uh, I do plan on doing a best governors and uh, best senators video. So maybe that's a consolation for you. Um, are we also, getting rid of the, the bad comments? Yeah. The, uh, yeah, I didn't see another one. Okay, um, good. I haven't, but I also would argue that finding more than 10 good presidents is kind of <laughs> difficult. Yeah, it was hard for me to come up with 10 the first time, because even like, 
I put James Garfield on there just mostly because of what he would have been, not because of what he was. <laughs> I love Garfield. Like, I yeah, mean, he, he loves lasagna. So, I mean, of course I like him. Wrong. <laughs> no, but yeah, Sorry, like I, I had to. <laughs> you should read some of his speeches. Seriously, though, you should but, read some of his speeches. He, uh, yeah, he was well, his, eloquent. His, anti, uh, his whole push to get rid of the spoil system started the to i mean he did a significant amount to end the spoil system in the little amount of time that he managed to serve and he was killed for his principles that's there you go. i mean like the person who killed him was miffed that he wasn't appointed because he thought that he would be uh, he would be <laughs> appointed as part of the spoil system but he was elected under ending the spoil system so exactly he, so he was literally killed for his values. That, that's a heck of a president. I've never heard it framed that way, but you're exactly right. I mean, yeah. So I'm more confident about my James Garfield pick than. <laughs> of course, um, my maybe my favorite president is William Henry Harrison. I thought you were going to say Woodrow Wilson there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> God no, no. William Henry Harrison. He served like a month. <laughs> so, so he couldn't do any damage so, I, so he is the best president <laughs> yeah anyway back to the state rivalries I think um, before we go to the questions because we have uh, suggestions for uh, future state rivalries are there any other comments that you want to bring up uh, from our two videos no I mean the, the main um, thing was just people saying whether or not there was a rivalry um mm -hmm. people from from kentucky and virginia generally say there isn't one people from west virginia generally say there is one though it also seems to depend where in west virginia um i actually had a couple of comments literally say oh, exactly that i couldn't believe how when i saw your video how as recently as 2011 that they several counties were trying to join virginia leave and yeah. leave west virginia i, I had uh, um somebody in uh the neighboring county in virginia um saying like we want them come <laughs> yeah and, and somebody responded to that guy like we wish we could <laughs> <laughs> poor west virginia yeah they i think they're down there uh in almost every category unfortunately um, yeah well west virginia has often become a brunt of a lot of, it has become a brunt of a lot of jokes yeah and, you know just like mississippi or like, arkansas well basically anywhere where you have a lot of people living in hills well maybe, that's an that would be a great video idea who, maybe many of them who are, might actually be named billy <laughs> oh, careful there <laughs> Um, so I'm curious to see if you got the same suggestions in your comments for future video ideas, because we've already talked about some, but every time we've done this, well, I guess it's only been twice now, but I've, I've gotten surprising, um, state rivalry suggestions. Um, I know we've already talked about North Dakota and South Dakota. There seems to be a lot of trash talking going on, but I'm not, not a whole lot of history there, but it, apparently there's a little bit. Um, and then texas and california but that doesn't seem to be rooted in history it seems to be I, more rooted and i i see current. that i see that one so often and it's like i i love how many of them will be like there's no rivalry between us and new uh, and new mexico there's a rivalry between us and california it's like tell california that <laughs> yeah i mean it's like, it's like california doesn't care about texas like, i think it's mostly rooted oh it's not rooted in anything it's just currently what's going on you do have um texas of course gaining a lot of population and uh, political power and economic power and, and catching up with california there's a lot of californians that in fact moved to texas because of the lower cost of living and so maybe Californians that's who move everywhere it's they a big, do it's a big freaking state yeah um, colorado too yeah you know it's it's one of those ones where it's like you're you're really just like texas is just nipping at the heels of of california mm -hmm. it's like if both states were separated from the union and made their own economies they would form the third and fourth largest economies in the world yep california then texas 
The only thing is, Texas has this kind of like inferiority complex. You know, it it basically, uh, you know, they they always are like, we're the big guys. We have our own power system. We're we're like we're our own republic and blah 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 it's you're, like, make, well, you're making a bunch of texans mad right now <laughs> probably um but the uh but all of that pales in comparison to california mm-hmm. you know like you might ha- texas might have its own power supply but literally like all of the rest depend uh, all of the west depends on california if California drops, even your state would lose power. Right. So, like, there's a great book by, uh, what's it called? Uh, Eric Pomeranz? Pomeroy? Something like that called uh, The Pacific Slope. Um, the Pacific Slope? Slope, yeah. Okay. Um, And it's basically talking about how the West ha- was and still remains completely dependent on California. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, like, I, even though I was born there, I don't exactly have skin in the game because I was, I grew up in uh, Nevada. So, you know, if you want to talk about rivalries, but with California, Nevada has an actual rivalry. Um, you know, and it it can be pretty vicious. Um, for instance, they just put a bunch of power stations on the road just south of the border that are these like big old reflector stations. Um, you know the the kind that literally like burn uh, that like burn birds as they fly through the light. Um, you know they're called they're the birds are literally called burners and you can find them scattered all over the place. Um, but the uh some nevadans call those the three middle fingers because there's three towers Mm -hmm. and they're right there on the border and when california was discussing where to put them they brought up our they brought up nevada's capture of oj simpson as like an unwillingness to extradite him um as reason for putting it there it was literally vindictive. Jeez. That's crazy. <laughs> but that's and recent. That's, that's, yeah, like, that was being built while I was going, that was, uh, like, 2014, 2015. Wow. Yeah, this is real, this is an ongoing issue. Hell, the border is still not resolved. They keep on having to remeasure it over and over and over again. And the and that border was fought over during the Sagebrush Rebellion. Uh, that resulted yeah, in like eight people dead. Are you going to do something? that one next then, or Nevada, California? That could be a good one. Because I'm thinking Texas and Oklahoma I, might be. I don't know. Was... It, like with Nevada, like when it comes to California, it's just there's so much yeah. to talk you, about. You could do like 20 different videos, but yeah, I, I mean Texas really too. I think Texas and Oklahoma. There's a little bit of history there. I. I haven't researched it much. I just have been Greer told county. that. What's, what county? Greer County. Oh, uh, okay. That That's ringing a bell. Yeah, um, Greer County was... was uh, they never actually killed anybody, but they brought militias back and forth. And, uh, you know, there was... Uh, during the, during the, uh, the land rush uh, of the, uh, like, 1890s, 1893... Something like that. Basically, what made Oklahoma Oklahoma rather than Indian territory? Oh, the Sooners, um, eighteen ninety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when they went in and occupied Greer County, uh, that's when it got really heated. Um, I don't think anybody like ended up killing each other, but there was some uh, there was some issues with like closing down bridges and like at one point they had like two bridges. Uh, I, I'm only pulling this off the top of my head, so I could easily be wrong. But like, I remember something about there like being two bridges built right next to each other, so that like one was the Texan bridge and one was the Oklahoman bridge, and they closed down either side of the other's bridge. 
Yes. <laughs> so like two bridges yeah. built to to close down both of them at the same time anyways. Oh, it seems so petty. Oh yeah. Uh, well, we're talking about Texas here. <laughs> um a couple other suggestions that I get a lot um are Wisconsin and Illinois. Uh, and there's a lot of hatred there between those two states that I didn't realize until recently. Yeah. And uh, also, oh gosh, I'm blanking now. I'm getting, I've gotten a lot of the uh, this versus everyone. Yeah. Comments. Oh, We're, New York and New Jersey. Yeah. Have you heard I, that I, one? I have to wonder how much of it, like, is a, like, you could bring it back to, uh, I mean, they're both, they were both Swedish possessions. Um, so no, but I, I don't know. Yeah. That, again, I think it's more of a recent thing, kind of like, I mean, and then I think it's more of a cultural difference. You see that maybe also slightly related to sports rivalries, um, but not really even that. I mean, I just think there's that, uh, that kind of like, even you see with even in the boroughs of New York City itself, how there's almost this mini yeah. nationalism going on. Like, yeah, oh, if you're in, you're from Manhattan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're the elitist. And I'm from Queens. You know, like, yeah, it's the, uh, there's always going to be regional rivalries, but it's really much more interesting when it's based on something. Yeah. So that's the thing. And that was kind of a little disappointing to, a lot of the comments like for suggestions it's just like well maybe it'd be fun for me to do my geography series my compared series for that but for this series our state rivalries yeah we want something with more historical substance, substance. yeah yeah and it's like sometimes regional rivalries are very much based on on something you know they have some reason why um like uh you know, there's been some silly border dispute that's been going on for a century or something along those lines. But most of the time, it's it's just like, I hate their drivers. Which, yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, while I would love to talk about, like, if I was to do a Nevada one, I'd love to talk about how, like, Nevada was created by sectioning off more and more of Utah. Um, and that caused a bunch of friction. Um especially eventually uh basically evicting people out of uh um uh pioch um where there was this whole interesting dynamic between um american indians specifically the paiutes um the uh mormons and the miners um, there's an excellent book by that name. I think it's just called Mormons, Myers, and Indians. Um, but uh, the uh, then there's also the interesting bit about how like um, Southern Nevada used to be part of New Mexico territory. Then it, when it was split in 1863, it was uh, it was Arizona territory, and then eventually. What became Las Vegas, well, what was Las Vegas at that point in 1868 um, was given to Nevada. And so the one of the founders of, of Nevada, uh, Octavius Decatur Gass, um, was actually attending the Arizona legislature when tax collectors came down to collect his old taxes that he didn't know that he owed. And uh, that became a dispute, and that's basically what lost him the ranch, um, eventually giving it to the Stewarts, and the Stewarts were the ones who sold it to Clark, as in Clark County, um, you know, mm. the railroad and the creation of Las Vegas as a town in 1905. Um, so, like, these are things that have direct consequences to today, but most people are are barely even aware of it if they are. And, uh, you know, most, most of them aren't aware of it at all. Hell, the number of people who would know what Stewart and gas street is named after is pretty minuscule. Yeah. I, I always, uh, I find it interesting how I drag my family to historical locations that are nearby and 
these places are always uh, like empty. There's nobody there and nobody ever thinks about, yeah, something like street names. Like where did that name come from? Why is it all, all these names this? And uh, what, what are the first settlers of an area actually went through to start that, you know, uh, yeah. city or county or whatever. And so much went into that. And we just kind of, uh, and, and, you know, most of us won't move too far. Like you've lived in three different States, right? Mm -hmm. In your life. I mean, most of us, I lived in two, most of us won't live too far away from where we were born and raised, uh, in yeah, our lifetime. A, and that's also, if you mean lived for more than a year. Because, you know, that like, I guess yeah. you could say that I lived in Kentucky and uh, Illinois. Oh, that's right, with your military. I mean, and... Indiana. Um, How long were you but... in Afghanistan? A year. Oh, see, so yeah. I would say you lived in Afghanistan, yeah. Well, like... it was technically uh, 10 and a half months or something like that. That's a long time, yeah. yeah. So you, you're, that's different compared to, I think, most people. I mean, if you're not somebody who travels much or in the military, I think. Well, even... Even before the military, like when I was a kid, we traveled a lot. Um, I've basically been in all of the northern states at some point in my life. Um, yeah, you're too afraid but, of the south. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't made it any further south than, uh, well, obviously I've been in Texas, but um, I was actually at San Antonio for a conference recently. But um, in I haven't made it further south than Tennessee or uh, North Carolina. And we literally drove through Virginia to uh, like our rule. Oh. I'm gonna pull my book here while you're talking, sorry. So our, our rule was that you have to at least put your foot to the soil for it to count as you being there. So, <laughs> so we literally did, we went all the way to the border with uh, North Carolina put our feet on the ground and turn back around to DC. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, there you go. That's, I kind of do the same thing. I, um, I've, I've been meaning to bring up this book and I know you've heard of it cause you've heard of the TV show, probably at least the, how the States got their shapes. Oh, and yeah. I feel like this is like a great way to like, give us more ideas for the series. And um, I was reading in here about the show seriously War. screwed up on Nevada though. Oh, did it? I'm sure it oh, did. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, if it screwed up on Nevada, I'm sure it screwed up on other uh, states too. But, but yeah, like uh, I, but take of course, I don't know how much of the show was actually like based on the book. You know, yeah, I don't always know that economy might be pretty loose. But uh, the uh, we we take borders for granted, you know, and I just. It does fascinate me, uh, borders, especially within, um, like you look at county borders, the fact that we have over 3,000 counties in the United States and uh, some of the shapes of them are just like, what? Why? Like, I think every uh, every one of them has a story, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I, should we get to the questions here? I feel bad. Like, I, I uh, it may, there may not be that many questions, but should we open it to questions? Oh, I definitely should. I haven't really been monitoring it. Um, my my wife's on there. Shout out to Shannon. Oh, Mrs. Beat. Uh, she's hopefully taking care of the uh, the naughty commenters. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I see him. Okay, well, uh, swastika and everything. Yikes. Um, it's amazing the amount of hatred that can be spread on the internet. <laughs> well, uh, I do seem see some familiar commenters. Um, I Mr. Luke just keeps going on and on about Illinois and Wisconsin. Okay, I got gotcha, you, Mr. Luke H. <laughs> uh, Chris says Texas and New York. Um, do I have a wife? No. <laughs> <laughs> nope. All right. Uh, well, should we go back here? Let's see. I'm going to go. I'm going to scroll up a little bit. Most of these bit. are about like, uh, you know, what about this rivalry and that? And like, for instance, there's an, one that says uh, from Chris Namick, uh, you know, Texas versus New York. Yet again, yep. it's at, and at that point, it's New York biting at the heels of uh, Texas. <laughs> In the hierarchy of states, 
Tech, uh, New York comes third. You know, what's fascinating is that, uh, well, probably not that fascinating to most people, but after this census next year, I think New York's going to lose an electoral vote or two. Texas is going to gain a vote or two. So something to look at, like the, the country keeps moving south. Oh, okay. Kind of. If Wilson was alive today, he'd be a Republican, somebody said. Nicholas, Nicholas said that. <laughs> well, certainly, yeah. Yeah. Although, if he was alive today, I don't think he could possibly have, uh, have held his, uh, as his views as he does today, uh, like, in the present. He was you know, He'd be this, like, far-right extreme. He'd be, you know. Jeb Bush. Wouldn't he be Jeb Bush today? <laughs> Jeb Bush is a far right. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Like Trump, because Trump has taken the Republican Party. Um, a, no, I mean like literal, like Klansmen. Oh, wow. That's an interesting, because I, yeah, he kind of is a combination because I always, I think also of his um, neoconservatism kind of ambitions, but also mixed with uh, neoliberal, neoliberalism in terms of, is well, neoliberalism uh, free trade, neoliberalism. I guess, economically. Ne neoliberalism and neoconservatism aren't contradictory. Um, in fact, neoliberalism yeah. reinforces neoconservatism. No, that's what I mean. They they kind of complement each other there, yeah. Oh, but, no, I, um, Wilson was definitely not a neoliberal. Um, you know, he he was not a well, free market, you know. He's free trade. He wanted the lower tariffs, if I remember correctly. Yeah, well, that's just, he was a Democrat. Um, <laughs> but he uh, he didn't really have much basis on why um, this wasn't some... Uh, also, tariffs aren't a concern for neoliberals. Um, as, uh, as Slavoj Žižek aptly put it, um, neoliberalism is the destruction of the public by the private. Um you know, it's literally trying to privatize public everything, things. and that's mm -hmm. definitely not what L Wilson was doing. Yeah, and it's purest form, definitely. I would agree with that. But there's obviously different strains of it. The people that labels kind of applied in different ways, I think, and it's also probably evolved quite a bit since Wilson's time. But uh, we got Wilson, a couple Wilson fans in the comments. I thought I did. I read that correctly. Wilson fans? Oh. No, those don't <laughs> exist. <laughs> uh, uh, just the the typical. He wasn't the worst. <laughs> um, Who do you like, want to be the Democrat nominee in twenty twenty? And check out my railroad videos. Okay, Capital Limited Productions. All I will do that. Do you uh, want to answer that question? We got a. We got a uh, Super chat, first of all, and I have to oh. like e even look at the nominees to freaking. <laughs> yeah, there's too there's, many of them too. There's eat. fifty. Um, uh, Emma Hilton. Hey, Emma. I yeah. Thanks for the uh, the super chat. Uh, she didn't leave a comment. She just wanted to contribute. So thank you. Um, yeah, like I, it's cool to see names I'm recognizing because I do recognize like uh, a lot of these names and. Um, I appreciate you. I, I, if I don't respond always, uh, I'm sorry. I try to, but sometimes it can be hard. All right. So back to the comments. Uh, in terms of who would be the best Democratic nominee, I have no freaking clue. Like, as long as they're not trying to base their entire campaign about being anti-Trump, like, they'll probably do good with that. Just not yeah. Bernie Sanders. He's he's not like we need somebody younger. <laughs> he's up there. Um, I I I think the candidates that are most exciting to me are the ones who have actual ideas, like uh, you know um, Andrew Yang, of course. I saw a Yang Gang comment earlier. Um, Tulsi Gabbard is great. Uh, I like uh, I I like the idea of just you know, are we going to have good debates? Obviously, yeah. that's that's going to be destroyed by our current president. But like somebody who could actually like deal with him, um, uh, the, yeah. uh, the former I mean, vice I, the former vice president. I'm forgetting his name. Um, but Joe know, Biden. 
Yeah, Joe Biden. I might yeah, like him. I might like him just because he might be because of the name Joe. But um, <laughs> that's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but um, I don't know. He's he's just a wacky character, and I don't know. I, I I like at least having a character there. You know, I don't yeah. want squeaky clean candidates. I want I want some blood in the water. <laughs> well, we got that with President Trump. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. But like, I want it on both sides. <laughs> Um. Oh, what's your opinion on Ben Shapiro? Uh, he Negative. talks very, very quickly. He's a he, he talks very quickly. Sometimes he uses big words. <laughs> uh, Stonewall. Hey, this is to you, uh, Cipher. Did you know that Stonewall Jackson led an expeditionary force to West Virginia in the winter of eighteen sixty one? Yes, that was one of the two um, expeditions the uh, Confederacy sent. Um. And there was another one in 1863. Um, and Jackson was particularly, uh, um, you know, suited to the task because he was going home. Um, by the way, Super Chat. Oh, yeah, Super Chat, yeah. Um, oh, just, just Darian Vista. Thank you, Darian. Appreciate the uh, the Super Chat donation. Thank you. Uh I, somebody commented about the Green New Deal. That'd be an interesting thing to talk about. Do you know it's, much about it, though? Um, I've uh, I read chunks of it when it first came out, but I don't remember much. All I Isn't know it? is that it's like ridiculously ambitious, and uh, and you know, it's it's a House resolution. It's not anything. It like it has nothing binding about it. It's just a bunch of goals. Yeah, I mean, it has that name, Green New Deal. For what I understand about it is, if you compare it to the original New Deal, the original original New Deal was written in a way to actually get passed. And I know, of course, back, I mean, FDR had a Congress that worked with him and, and those, uh, especially his, his first term. But so um, somebody from the Trump Army of Kentucky wants me to be kicked. <laughs> That's a that's a character. Yeah, I, yeah. He oh my gosh, he super chatted me. Yeah, he he did a super chat on one of my live streams, and he wanted me to specifically call out other YouTubers, and I refused. Then he started throwing a bit of a tantrum. What? So. Why does he not like you? I saw. Yeah. What? What's? What is Trump Army of Kentucky's problem with you? What started because the whole I thing? Because I wouldn't say the super chat. He specifically wanted me to call out other YouTubers, and I wouldn't do that. Oh, well. Hey, be nice to Cypher, okay? Um, but thank you for <laughs> the Super it. Chat donation. <laughs> I We have I'm, another one, though. Thanks for watching. Oh, Thomas. Yeah, Thomas Amali. Uh, he says, Wilson favored expanding the size of government and created the Federal Reserve. He would not be a Republican today. Yeah, that's what kind of when I first heard he'd be Republican today kind of threw me off a little bit because it's, traditionally you do think of, you know, presidents like Coolidge and yeah, uh, but conservatism has drastically changed since then. Well, um, but he said Republican, not conservatism. So yeah, well, Wilson was conservative, but obviously not Republican. I thought, um, yeah, that's an interesting thing to always like, uh, I wonder in some ways, uh, president Trump is not like, conservative. Um, yeah. So that's another thing to think about too, is how when we say it's conservative, um, we're generally meaning um, stick to what we have already, um, st stick to a, a limited government, a more humble approach, uh, like have more faith, I guess, in the institutions or uh, the constitution specifically in terms of the United States, you know, what, what we have, have more faith in that as opposed to trying to rewrite the rules, you know, in order for reform. Is that, what, what would you add to the definition of conservatism? Because that's something that. Well, somebody just did a interesting take on it. Um, Innuendo Studios um, did a thing about like the origins of conservatism, talking about like Burke and all that kind of stuff. Mostly because people were like, you don't get it. conservatism. And it's like, 
and he was just saying like, no, I do. There's where I'm getting this from. Um, but the, uh, well, I don't exactly agree with him on um, his definition of conservatism. It's useful. Um, I can't remember the wording, but it's it's basically about reinforcing the idea of that there will be a hierarchy and what we've got right now is good enough. Yeah, and that hierarchy doesn't have to necessarily be tied to any kind of um, monarchy. Again, I, I don't exactly agree with that. Yeah, I like, don't think that that's exactly what conservatism is. But yeah. he, he backs it up pretty well. I hear that 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 correlation. And, and a lot of, um, I would argue that um, the last part of the 20th century into the 21st century has been very conservative. I think most of our lifetimes like has been, because we see leadership in Congress and, I mean, I'm talking about the United States here, um, but in Congress and the president, Supreme Court, all three branches have uh, have really been either, you know, leaning to conservative, the conservative side or or moderate, like say Bill Clinton, I would say was a very centrist president. Well, one thing, like I'm in a, uh, I'm in a uh, history of capitalism in the 20th century, I think is the title of the uh, um, class. And um, well, it's not exactly 20th century since we're literally ending with a history of the Obama presidency. So great recession. Yeah. Tw well, no, the presidency itself. Um, oh. But the, uh, um, yeah, there's there's already historians writing on it. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Well, actually, um, that that book was published in uh, it, like uh, was published like two years after his uh, presidency. We haven't gotten to it yet. But uh, the the main point thrust of this class is trying to understand what neoliberalism is, uh, like how it came to exist, and how does it function. Um, neoliberalism as like a new form of capitalism. Because oh, yeah. um, much, uh, despite the sound of the name, since we have such weird names for politics, neoliberalism has nothing to do with le whether or not you're liberal or conservative. That, like that, that doesn't matter. Yeah, we're talking economics here. I mean, it well, you can well, carry over not... to social and politics too. But yeah, I mean, it's, well, it's... Uh, basically, it's the idea that like. Um, even if you're going to have welfare policies, they need to be privatized. You know, like right. everything should be private. The government, sh uh, if the gov government is involved, it's only as a regulator. Um, you know, that's purely it. Right. Sorry, I got another super chat here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Kyle, the oh. Jellyman Pro again. Thank you, Kyle. Um, and he, I'm excited. He says, can you explain why Grover Cleveland was so good? Um, you may or may not know this uh, <laughs> cipher, but I'm a big fan of Grover Cleveland. Um, I the reason why I like him starts with character. I think he he had integrity, and um, but also if I look if you look at his foreign policy and his um, economic policy, I, I was fairly a big fan of of that as well. Um, he was consistent. He was principled. He he's the um, one who uh, who had like a separated presidency, right? Yeah, non-consecutive terms. Um, he his reputation was hurt quite a bit by a, a depression um, that. Oh yeah, he was during eighteen ninety three, right? Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. Yeah. Eighteen yeah, ninety yeah, three. That'll, that'll do it. <laughs> yeah, and you know, for better or for worse, presidents get blamed or, or given credit for how the economy is doing. And we, I mean, we know that if the economy went into a major recession over the next year, that there's no way that President Trump would get reelected. Just, just no way. Yeah. Um, and and that's just how it goes. You know, they get. But I mean, I think that was the debate with uh, McCain versus uh, Obama. Oh yeah. It was like, how can McCain possibly hope to win? Like, we have a Republican incumbent in a down economy. Yeah. Republicans <laughs> lose automatically. Like, just it doesn't matter what their policies are, they lose. That's yeah. Just, that's just the way it, like I the, I remember God this back in 2008 I don't remember 2008 that well at all but um I remember talk about like 
and I don't know if this holds up, but like that, there's never been a president who has been whose incumbent party um, saw over an economic recession or something like that that got reelected. Um, yeah, we can predict I, it. In my economics class, we actually do that. We in 2016, we were able to predict that Trump would get elected purely on economic data. I think I've told you this before. And yeah. the, it was mostly because of um, like, sure, the economy was recovering um, steadily. The, you know, uh, GDP growth was something like three to four percent each quarter. And but the most of the wealth was going to the richest one um, percent of the country. Um, Health care was prices were skyrocketing. Um, college tuition, student loans, that was all getting really bad. Um, you also had, I mean, it, it really the, the misery, economic misery index, when you look at, it's not just unemployment, it's not just GDP overall. A lot of it has to do with, with, uh, purchasing power, you know, like, uh, look at how much credit card debt there is. I mean, these little things, if you just look at the full picture of so, so many times when you look at macroeconomics, it's just like people forget how it, this, it affects day to day life for average people, average citizens. We, we just look at the overall picture like, oh, yes, trends seem to be doing all right. Uh, uh, they look at the stock market, which is not that, a good thing to look at. When that's another thing with neoliberalism, right, is that it's it's a triumph of the micro over the macro. Um, it's about individualism rather than collectives. Um, it's about individual good rather than collective good. Um, which I think and, is important to look at. Um, yeah, there's one book. Um, I'd have to go. Uh, my bookcase is over in the other room now. So uh, <laughs> um, it's called The Age of Fracture. I cannot remember. Oh, The Age of Fracture. I read that one. I got that one back there, too. <laughs> yeah, that's a great yeah. book. Uh, it, it's especially interesting in how much it diverges from economics. Like, this guy loves his historiography. <laughs> and Daniel T. Rogers. Um, and <laughs> Daniel T. Rogers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. We're storking it out tonight with our books, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's that's what take, I do, man. <laughs> take a drink every time you see you hear us reference a book. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That was a great, this is a great one. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a whole, I, I can send you the syllabus after this. Um, it's, it's a fascinating class because like this book was being juxtaposed against um, the great exception. Um, the great exception. Um, by, wait, that was by Cowie? Really? Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I don't. I'm not. That's not I, ringing the bell. Great uh, the, exception. The, well, he really famously wrote another book called um, "Staying Alive," which is like looking at the 1970s change in economics through a cultural lens. But Ooh. he wrote. I I've already read that book, and apparently, I didn't realize it was Pat Cowie. <laughs> <laughs> but. <Yeah. laughs> Uh, we have another super chat, uh, Darian Vis Vista again. Thanks, Darian, for uh, the donation. Um, he says he's a future political science grad, so I'm, I'm sure he's uh, hanging by like maybe what what you're going through right now too. Uh, <laughs> but uh, do you have any history podcasts slash movies, books, and documentaries y'all recommend? That's pretty start? broad. I mean, yeah, well, maybe like what, what you've been looking at recently. Yeah, could, one thing that I always say when that, somebody asks me for books recommend, recommendations is on what? Because uh, like just history in general is by far the most broad topic you could possibly name. And so it's it's difficult to say like, you know, what are you looking for to get out of it? Um, so like be sure to comment that um but also i am uh, when it comes to just general reference material i am always going to recommend the durants um uh, will and ariel durant the story of civilization it's it's hmm. probably a bit expensive to get a hold of the whole set 
although you can get it digitally for fairly cheap um, or through like audible or scribd or anything along those lines like fantastic authors and um doing what's called generalism as in like trying to talk about everything um in a better way than i think really anyone has ever done arnold toynbee is another example of of generalist writing but toynbee honestly is He's too English, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Like he's he really likes the. Now British. you're making the English. <laughs> yeah, I'm not making the today at all. That, um, <laughs> yeah. By the way, I just looked it up. At uh, Story of Civilization is on archive.org. Um, no way. Yeah. The whole the whole thing. Yeah, for free. There's so, like 17 sorry. books. Sorry, I know Scribd is a, was a sponsor of our videos, but sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, you're not going to get the audio book through, through archive.org. That's how I read a few of them, because, mm. like, whew, they are dense books. Um, I mean, podcasts, I always, one of my go-tos for many years now has been Hardcore History, yes. Dan Carlin. I, I'm uh, he doesn't release very often, though. But when he does, it's pretty epic, and it's a freaking event. Yeah, yeah. He uh, he digs in deep. I mean, he's not a historian, but he, you know, it's pretty clear that he takes his research seriously. And um, now, honestly, even though he he often will, in the middle of his podcast, be like, "I'm not a historian," but um, <laughs> just like Sammy from US 101, does the same. Yeah. <laughs> Neither are I, you. <laughs> yeah. I remember the first time I watched it, I like commented like. Yeah, but I am. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but uh, um, what makes a historian is whether or not you are contributing to the scholarship. And I think that podcast, at by this point, could define contributing to the scholarship. I know for a fact that Dan Carlin has gone to conferences to talk about doing the podcast, academic mm -hmm. conferences. So obviously it is valued as such. So that would make him a historian on whatever topic he is contributing to. That's a good point. And, uh, you know, Sammy, he, he's, well, I don't know if he's published the papers outside of uh, college, but yeah, like he's well on his way of becoming a historian. I mean, um, another, if Wait, you're in the, what's that? Wait, is that History 101? Yeah, yeah. History okay. He, yeah, he's, he's uh, getting a uh, history education thing. I don't exactly know what that degree. Like, I I know well, that it's for uh, like it can be applied to high school, but I don't know if that's meant to like also go towards like a faculty position at a university or something like uh, that. Yeah, it is. A, I think he's working on a master's, if I remember yeah. correctly. Similar. It was a similar program to what I did, but anyway. Uh, Dan Carlin also used to have a, a more uh, political science, like modern current events uh, podcast as well called uh, Common Sense, but he stopped doing it after Trump got elected. I think he <laughs> he kind of realized he didn't know he was in over his head. And but yeah. uh, I wish he would he would bring it back. I mean, I used to love that as well. I think I listened to one of them and just kind of went like, but I want hardcore history. <laughs> Oh, they um, want my link to my Discord. Um, if you want my link to my Discord, I, I save it. I save it for my Patreon supporters. So, uh, oh. if you're, yeah, I mean, should I open it up to more? Because there's not many people on there. Maybe well, I should just open it up. I would say uh, when I opened up my Discord towards uh, towards everyone, I made sure one there are separate channels just for patrons. Oh. So you have to set that up. But also, I asked my patrons um themselves I, I i let them make the decision on that because i i don't think it would be right for me to just unilaterally make that decision okay then i will do what you suggest i'm gonna ask my patreon supporters first if they are cool with it and then i'll do it for you guys so um stay tuned tanner keeps talking about the uh 1904 st louis olympics uh it's just so crazy to check out, especially the marathon. Yeah, I, I've, he's not the first person. My my friend's uh, dad was telling me about the 1904 uh, Olympics and how it was. Uh, it would make a good video. 
Um, I mean, I, I don't... I did an episode on, like, the Olympics a long time ago, but I don't remember. Yeah, um, I have no idea. Is one? Or I don't know. Calorie or whatever they call it. Um, oh, no, that's the one that was next to the World's Fair. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right, because in my St. Louis video, I remember coming across that. So, yeah, that, he says, uh, Jeff says, John Boy did a video on it. It's great. The history guy recently did a video about it. Okay, oh, the then. History guy. All right, we'll check it out. Heck Has, yeah. By the way, do you know if anybody's actually contacted him? <laughs> I, I don't think anybody's contacted him. Um, contacted who? The history guy. Oh, you mean for our little elite Slack. club <laughs> of history YouTubers? Our, yeah. The, we, the history elite. <laughs> we should reach out to him for sure. Oh, yeah. Wait. No, according to uh, according to that one guy who who uh, went after Kurt Skasakt, we're the we're the education mafia. No, oh, yeah, it, it, <laughs> I'm not in the education mafia. I try yeah. to get in. It's basically people Although, that are with standard. knowing better is. <laughs> yeah, knowing better. A lot of uh, our pe people in our circles are, but it's all right. We'll start, it's, we'll start our own. We'll start our, our own mafia. I think he was the only one mentioned in that video. I mean, it, it's a made-up term, but like, yeah, <laughs> it was, it was like when I saw Knowing Better on there, I was like, "Hey, he made it!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good for him. He also got like four hundred thousand subscribers in right? one year. Good so Lord. there's that. <laughs> um, Emma, I, Emma says I don't really understand or get into this stuff, but I support you. <laughs> Yeah, the thing is, I want to say this. Um, your viewers, uh, Cypher, in general, seem to be at a little bit higher level than I am and that many of my viewers are. So, like, I feel like uh, I feel like when I want to learn something, I go to your channel or I when I go to, like, Will from The Exploration because I'm just like, whoa, this is deep. This is a lot deeper than what I go. So I feel like when when uh, we talk sometimes, well, your knowledge is just so vast that some people are just like, "This guy is uh, overwhelming me." <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> that's my way of complimenting you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I I think you're focused on a very different demographic. Um, you're you're focused on um on education for uh, like as a teacher because you have yeah. a great deal of experience in that whereas i honestly wouldn't know where to start on that like my my stuff is only so deep as i'm willing to go you know it's it's like um it's just hi uh, you're embarrassing me <laughs> <laughs> well no yeah and you make a good point because i started out teaching you know, uh, middle school, seventh and eighth graders. And so like, if you look at some of my older videos, I feel like they are kind of more um, introductory explainer type videos where it's only been the last two or three years where I've tried to dig a little bit deeper for certain topics, you know. I've been doing um, an excellent job of it too. Like I remember the, uh, was it the political one? The, why do we get so angry about politics one? And oh. or like, like, there's some you've been hitting some uh, controversial subjects like in that even-handed manner that I don't think even I can muster in some ways. Oh well, thanks. Yeah, I I like, try. It helps if that you I'm had a... the history of feminism. You probably wouldn't have been as so uh, as aggressive as I was. <laughs> oh, I, at the end of your video, I thought it was funny how you were you're kind of going on a little rant, but but yeah, like uh, the it helps that I am. Pretty much, I've never been affiliated with a political party. I've always been a contrarian. Like, uh, it, I find myself whenever there's a conservative president, I find myself going to the left, and if there's a liberal president, I find myself going to the right because I'm just like I don't want to agree with anybody too much. I love to play devil's advocate, and I don't want to get too comfort comfortable with my views, you know, and become ideological because I think ideologies are. You know they they can they can be potentially dangerous. I mean, it gets you on this very narrow path, and then uh, you get tunnel vision. You lose context. So, which I think you're. I mean, most of us. I don't mean to pat ourselves on the backs here, but 
I think most of us doing this history YouTube thing are, we, we have a fairly balanced approach. It's not like we have this very, you know, specific agenda that we're trying to promote, except for maybe Tristan from uh, Step Back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's very explicit about it. Um, you know, and like, I, I'm unapologetic about my feminism video being apologetic. Um, like that, that is essentially apologistic history. Um, but I also think it comes at a time that it's really needed. Um, you know, I, at no point do I say like, you have to be a feminist, nor do I even really consider myself a feminist. Um, my mother's definitely a feminist. She actually teaches, uh, that subject, you know, that part where in the video where I'm like literally saying, um, you know, I grew up around academic feminists because mm. my mother is one. Um, you know, so while I certainly have that, the, uh, the, uh, well, actually, my mom gets attacked by feminists sometimes for being too second wave. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> actually, I, you... actually, I heard one of her colleagues call her first wave once. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, that was like, that was harsh, what? man. <laughs> Let's go back to eighteen forty-eight. Yeah, like, that's seriously that was basically the tone of the conversation. And it's like, <laughs> God, when when I was saying like I know the insular community these people foster, like, yeah, I've I've watched it in action, um, and I get it, but at the same time, that's the point of the video is that it's like it, you're taking a part for the whole. Um, you know, the whole shows this idea of progress. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think we can be fairly impartial, um, while engaging in serious subjects, but sometimes it does take getting the, getting a little bit preachy, you know, um, especially like, like next week's video, you're going to see it in full force. Yeah. I am anti-conspiracy theorist full stop like i don't if <laughs> if you're an anti conspiracy if you are a conspiracist i don't want your money um yeah like I, we've talked about that before because i tend to, i tend to be especially when i was younger i was more open to at least questioning things like um you know uh i mean because yeah, there have been there's real a difference between conspiracism and and questioning that's that's oh those, i see that's one of those constant things that you see uh, conspiracy theorists justify their position um, by saying that, oh, I'm just asking questions. What's wrong with inquiry? It's like because well, the, they're not they're usually giving answers right after those questions. That's the problem. Well, they're also not really ans asking questions. They're denying evidence. Oh, yeah, that happens. Too. That's that's the main way a conspiracy theory is put out well and there's like, all but what there's i want to slightly disagree because sometimes the evidence just isn't there like and that doesn't mean they can fill in the gap can you know conjecture shouldn't just automate like uh because yeah let, history is incomplete there's no way we can ever know the full story and so if there isn't well, evidence that's not really a conspiracy theory at that point if it's just filling in the gaps that's just right fiction um uh, oh well but th see i would i would say that because if you're a conspiracy theorist, that means you are basically creating a theory to explain, uh, it, say the the evidence is missing from from uh, an, you know research or an investigation. Then yeah, you are saying, well, this is what actually happened. So to me, that is a kind of fiction. Yeah. Um, well, that's so. For instance, I just wrote a. Uh, episode, I haven't recorded it or anything, um, but uh, of Butch Cassidy and the Sun Yen, Sundance Kid. And there's a lot of theories about like whether or not um, Butch Cassidy um, survived Bolivia. We know for sure he was in South America. We don't even know if it was Bolivia. <laughs> we know that he was in Argentina at one point, held a farm there, and started going north. Does that mean Bolivia? Maybe. The string of crimes that are attributed to Dos Gringos 
probably is referring to Butch Cassidy and Sundance and the Sundance Kid, but we don't know that for sure. The bodies were never identified. Attempts to go and recover the bodies and do DNA testing have been inconclusive. Um, so we don't know. So I would not, and I say this in the episode. I I would literally uh, I do not consider these things to be uh, like theories of him surviving it to be a conspiracy theory because mm-hmm. one there's no conspiracy you know they're not theorizing a conspiracy they're just saying like no this guy just this guy wasn't this thing he just went up and you know ended up in like nevada or something um you know as an old timer in good springs of all places <laughs> but mm. the theories get a bit wild and um, historians have rightly called it bull- bullpucky, but I wouldn't call it a conspiracy <laughs> theory. Oh, okay, so you make that distinction. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Um, I I have a weird super chat here. I I guess I guess I gotta <laughs> read it. You see it? Yeah. Uh, Tilted Sun says, uh, "Gents, why is no one talking about the mouthfeel? Does this have something to do with what you're drinking? Is that what I don't understand?" <laughs> no. <laughs> the feminine penis that's what it's about oh dear goodness okay um i probably should wrap it up here soon though so uh, it's it's okay it's it's about uh trans rights and all that but it, you know it, it was oh. it was something to put out by contrapoints um you know she talked about uh kitty <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, they wanted to see the cat so Oh, now she's her claw stuck to my shirt. Let go of the shirt. Oh, no. uh, Apparently, she didn't want to see them. <laughs> um, she's you can barely see her because she's um, she's black. She blends into my shirt. But uh, she just turned sixteen years old. This is my cat Ellie. So sixteen. Uh, yeah, she's seen some history. Uh, <laughs> all right. Now that she's freaking out here because the cord. Sorry. Ugh. Oh no! Now she's. Let me let go of the, the cord here. Oh. Somebody asked, when will I do the uh, review of Vice? Um, sometime during the summer will, will be when I watch it. Um, but what from what I've read, History versus Hollywood is an excellent site for this kind of stuff. And that was their most virile review I have ever read from them. And they tend to be very even-handed. Um, and like, even they were like, "This is going to be an Academy Award darling, and it's absolute crap. Don't watch this." And it's like, "Whoa, whoa, <laughs> slow <Okay>. down!" <laughs> like, that's my job. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I I've read a few reviews of it, um, and Cheney's uh, biographer, I can't remember her name, um who who wrote a rather nasty biography of him even she was like nope screw this movie it's a bunch of conspiracy crap and no uh, no 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 well so, i never saw i heard it was just kind of boring That's, but we i never saw it either yeah but uh, they got a bunch of awards and nominations yeah, of course it does yeah because um, it it appeases certain people's politics <laughs> um I got an email from somebody. They're so desperate to ask me this question. Um, so shout out to um, Bobby. Bobby wants to know my favorite ca- Trump cabinet members. Um, oh, I saw that question earlier. My favorite tr- Trump cabinet member is Ben Carson. Not because he necessarily does a good job at his position. I just like Ben Carson. I think Ben Carson is a lovely person. He's one of the nicest people ever. And uh, you don't find him a bit. Sleepy, sleepy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe that too. But uh, so yeah. There's your answer. I don't know if I'll go app beyond that because um, there's not a lot I, on his cabinet that I admire. I actually went after him on something recently. What was it? On Twitter? No, no. In the video. Oh really? Um. Oh yeah. He he pushed. I'm pretty sure he doesn't hold this view anymore because I mean it's so dumb. But like. Um, he pushed the whole, like, the, the, um, pyramids were granaries thing built by Joseph. Oh. <laughs> Joseph's granaries and that. And it's like, I, yeah. I ran into that, like, while I was researching that episode and I was like, I, I mean, like, I, I can't not include this. 
I remember that. <laughs> yeah, that was that was and uh incredible. It's like it's like he's he's believing something that was debunked in the 16th century. Like this is so old it's literally medieval. I mean, um, if you think about it though, think about religious beliefs and how uh that a lot of people believe lots of what was in, you know, ancient texts like as literal truth not only truth but truth with a capital t like yeah i mean so like it doesn't surprise that, me that people would have irrational beliefs you but know, it's them. not in the bible that's the thing um yeah like, at, least, at least the bible can be considered historical book you know right uh, it's like it's got its faults but like <laughs> yeah. um yeah I, I, on that video i've got people complaining that i was like yeah well genesis and exodus are out um <laughs> like mm. what? what 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 and it's like yeah sorry there's like there's no proof whatsoever to these things but um although abraham being from uruk like we didn't know about uruk but the bible mentions it so i mean there's there's something but mm -hmm. like that's it um post those books then you start getting into where like biblical literalism doesn't work obviously but um with some biblical criticism you can actually tease out things and possibly find new sites to dig and things like that there's a whole field of study called biblical archaeology um and it's it's produced some it, i mean obviously there are a lot of crackpots in it there are a lot of people who are like biblical literalists you know who who like want to show that the sun did different things in the fifth millennium bc and that's that's like and, the, and noah's ark type stuff too like the the global flood type thing well there's interesting stuff on noah's ark um because it's not the the bible is is actually plagiarizing other other sources right um i heard that too yeah well i mean it's it's directly quoting in certain places and then uh and then you know not just getting details wrong because i mean we're talking something that spans literally like 500 years of uh of that we can at least find in terms of actual um tablets and that there's a really interesting guy who found the uh the ta uh, the the most uh the the current version of the latest uh sumerian version of the flood myth um and guy has this like long white beard and just like great storyteller he works for the british museum i don't know his name mm. but um i mean like it, that guy is just fun to listen to i i watched like a thing from him about this specific topic that was just a talk that went for an hour and a half and he's just so good of a speaker that i i couldn't stop watching <laughs> <laughs> so like he's a he's a uh sumerianist i think that's the term um mm. like he can he can read um ancient sumerian sight unseen um and uh so, you know, he's he's an important scholar in the field and everything. And his he even had like a documentary where they made a version of the Sumerian Ark. As awesome. <laughs> well, there's also that Ark replica that's in Tennessee. Is that something oh, different? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> that's um. so dumb. <laughs> yeah, where they and then engineers came in. They're like, um, yeah, that wouldn't that would not work on water. That would not float. <laughs> well, here's the interesting thing that the Sumerian myth shows. It was round. Hmm. Really? Yep. That's weird. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Yeah, I have to check this guy out. Uh, if you ever come across his name. <laughs> I'm sure if we type in like let's try and then, this is how historical research works. Type Google. in and, yeah. It's like I know he's from the British Museum, so British Museum. I know that he talks about the Ark and Sumerian stuff. So if I type that in um here we go. There's the guy. What's his name? 
You found the beard. Yeah, oh, yeah. It was... A lot of people are mad that I, I uh, liked Ben Carson. I just thought he was nice, okay? I know he says stupid things. Dr. Irving Finkel. Irving Finkel. That's a funny name. <laughs> That's a great name. All right. <laughs> I'll just type yeah. it in. The cap. There we go. <laughs> in case I'm mispronouncing it. A um, serialologist. Wow, that's crazy. This is a uh, fascinating. Yeah, dude, you can find all kinds of stuff on YouTube with him. This is great. Uh, Tom Scott. The way I found him was Tom Scott did a episode where they did a Sumerian version. They played a Sumerian version of chess. Really? Um, yeah. Like. And this is a form. This is a board game that lasted for like two thousand years, so it's lasted longer than chess. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's another thing that we that is interesting about the ancient world is the sense of time. Um, yeah. How you know how a language like Akkadian could be used in the twenty second century BC. And then be and still be being used in the third century BC by people that freaking Alexander the Great is meeting. Yeah, it's crazy. Like that. That was the that was the language that um that uh come on. I I love Nietzsche and I can't remember the name. Zoroastrians were oh. using. Yeah. Thus spake Zoroastrians. Well, and to compare it, like, say, um, a language from uh, the time of uh, Jesus, uh, you know, being understandable today. Isn't that, like, the, the same time period length we're talking about here? Like, because you look at how much English has changed, you know? Yeah. Well, somebody commented on that episode, like, Cleopatra is closer to us than she was to the pyramids. Yep. Oh yeah, I've heard that before. That's that. It still blows my mind. It's actually incorrect, by the way. <laughs> well, I mean, it's but it's it. You know, it's um, like I know, it's still making a point though that major pyramid building ended in around seventeen hundred BC. Okay. Um, it's still though. That's a long freaking time between. <laughs> so she was closer to the Constitution. No, that's not right either. She was closer to the Renaissance than she was to. The pyramids, yeah. The pyramids, yeah. There we go. Still a long time, so we get the point. Yeah. These things get, you know, exaggerated, but um, it's one of the fascinating things about ancient history. Definitely. Um, I usually don't delve into ancient history much. Uh, right. However, <laughs> I've been watching Stefan Milo's videos, and he's been getting me more into it. Yeah. Well, he <laughs> he also keeps doing that archaeology stuff, and yeah, archaeology. <laughs> yeah i know it's like come on I now like i, I, I want books. I, I i i think i'm like obligated to be an elitist about the uh, archaeology we read they just <laughs> dig <laughs> uh yeah i don't even do that i don't even read anymore i just watch mostly videos i'm horrible uh, <laughs> um we probably should wrap this up though since uh it's a school night and uh I even had an yeah. st actual student on here say, Mr. Beat, what are you still doing up? <laughs> so um, is there anything uh, you want to say about this, like the series or I, I guess like to wrap this up before we go? Um, well, I love that we're doing it. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Maybe like, the next one will come a little bit sooner. Yeah. Um, well, we'll be seeing uh, that's something we'll be seeing each other in freaking at VidCon. So, yeah. Uh, that's going to be great. Um, and uh, I might actually have something to talk to you about that. Um, but uh, the, um, like, also think of it as kind of like a culmination of, like, how we've been kind of bouncing off of each other for uh, <laughs> five years now. Yeah, yeah. So. Six, six years. Jeez. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm hoping that you, uh, You'll lap me again, and then we'll just keep lapping each other all the way to a, you know a million subscribers. So you you just keep having that steady pace while I'm like woo woo. woo. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
but yeah, I think uh, we'll keep thinking about, keep those suggestions coming for state rivalries. And I think uh, the more evidence you can give to say that there's actually, this goes back then more than just a Some sort of historical significance. Yeah. Historical significance is what we're looking for. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching. Uh, and until next time, uh, I guess I'll chat with you off the air here. So who are? Sorry, you guys can't hear that. Okay. Good night, everybody. <laughs> All right.